Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Documentary filmmakers are explorers. I think the documentary is an exploration for ourselves. You know, we're learning something new, and if we're not, then we shouldn't be doing it. I think most of us with our documentaries, we're trying to do something positive and make our life mean something and to have a small part in, in making the world a better place. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 11. And it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, The Documentary Life Podcast, and The Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. This episode is another installment to our monthly conversations with a documentary industry person. This time out, I spoke with documentary filmmaker Faith Fuller, whose doc Briars in the Cotton Patch, a film that explores a little known but incredibly important story about the civil rights movements of the 50s and 60s, won an Emmy and has played on PBS in the U.S. for many years. She is also the founder and curator of the well-traversed website, Desktop Documentaries, a site that is a massive resource for all things documentary, in particular for first-time filmmakers. I held the conversation with Faith via Skype, as she and her husband are currently based out of San Miguel de Allende, Mexico. I'd been using Desktop Documentaries for a few years, so it was great to finally get to speak directly with the person who has been sharing such wonderful, inspirational, and instructive materials. And so with that... Let's listen in on the conversation that I had with Faith Fuller. Welcome to the documentary life. It's it's a pleasure speaking with you and and meeting you, albeit sort of the virtual sense. I think I reached out to you a few weeks ago initially, and it's great to be able to connect with you and hold this sort of shared conversation. Thanks for joining me today, Faith. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. It's funny to be honest and and completely frank. I. I I initially reached out to you because of your website, Desktop Documentaries. Yes. Um, I've been on the Desktop Documentaries mailing list for over, I guess, the past year, and I've really seen it sort of evolve during that time into a really good, really down-to-earth resource for documentary filmmakers. And I figured we'd spend, you and I would spend much of the time talking about your site, why you chose to do it, and what your connection to the documentary world was and sort of discuss the various online courses as well that you offer. And then a funny thing happened. I actually did some of my homework. <laughs> and, <laughs> and actually, <laughs> and actually Good took... Job. I know, Good amazing, job. right? I, I actually took a more journalistic approach to, to the upcoming wow. conversation. And yeah. I started looking into you and your background, Faith Fuller, and, and what I found got me way more excited about our conversation. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. I think I think what I what I'd love to do, Faith, for our listeners, is I'll go ahead and read. Um, this came off of your website under the you know about Faith Fuller section. I'd love to read this to give um, give the listeners a, a broader sort of context for what the conversation and who, who well what the conversation might be about and who you are. So if if you wouldn't mind, I'll go ahead and just read this straight from the website. Faith's okay. first independent documentary, Briars in the Cotton Patch, debuted on PBS in the United States and continues to be broadcast internationally. It showcased in film festivals across the country and won numerous accolades and awards, including a prestigious CINE, a regional Emmy, and two regional Emmy nominations. It is available on Amazon and for educational streaming on Canopy. 
Faith is a former television news anchor and reporter for CBS and NBC affiliates in South Carolina. In addition, she worked as an international journalist covering stories in Eastern Europe and the Middle East, including the first Gulf War from Saudi Arabia. As senior video producer with Habitat for Humanity International, she traveled worldwide, often as a one-woman film crew, capturing the inspiring true stories of the families and communities being transformed by the home-building organization. She has produced and edited dozens of award-winning videos and documentaries, ranging in length from 30 seconds to 60 minutes. She is currently the editor-publisher of DesktopDocumentaries.com, an online documentary filmmaking resource guide. Wow, Faith Fuller, again, very, very happy and full of gratitude to be speaking with you today. Oh. So it's, that's oh, it's wonderful. There, and, and my I, pleasure. Awesome. I mean, there's a lot here. And, and, <laughs> and, and I feel like a lot of my listeners, myself very much included, um, will be able to relate to much of this conversation. I think I would love to first start talking about your TV news experience. You were an anchor and reporter in various affiliates in South Carolina. How and when did this come to be, the, the TV news experience? Well, I went to Florida State University and graduated with a communications degree. And crazily, my uh, one of my professors said, oh, yeah, well, you can't graduate and actually become a TV news reporter. You know, it's too competitive. So I was like, oh, great. You know, I just paid all this money, you know, to get this education. And now I can't right. actually do what I've been trained to do. Well, you know, right. looking wow. back, that was the strangest advice I have ever heard. Um, thank goodness my father knew uh, one of the big anchors, top anchors in Charlotte, North Carolina, Sarah okay. James. Mm -hmm. And he said, when I told him, oh, yeah, well, I guess I can't do what I've been training to do. And he said, well, why don't you talk to Sarah? Just just get her get her um, feedback. So I talked to her and I explained, you know, I've been producing these, you know, little uh, TV shows at, at my uh, university. And uh, she said, oh, absolutely, you can get a job in TV news. So here's what you need to do. <laughs> and she gave me like a step-by-step -step plan of how to get a job in TV news. Um, and I can tell you that plan if you would like to hear it, but basically it worked. Yeah. And uh, I got in my car and traveled to four states and interviewed at 40 TV stations. Wow. I didn't wait for a job to open. Yep. I just you know, uh, wrote him a letter at the time he wrote letters. She didn't send an email uh, and, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, got interviews and got a meeting with the news director. And, and, uh, my first job was offered to me in South Carolina at a little, uh, CBS affiliate WBTW in Florence, South Carolina. And so, um, that started my TV career. Uh, you know, I was there for two years and then moved up to the NBC affiliate uh, in Columbia, South Carolina. And I was okay. there for five years and, uh, yeah, just, uh, loved it, loved it, loved it. And there's a lot about it that I miss. Uh, but, mm. but it was a phenomenal, uh, journey and, uh, a phenomenal start kickstart to, to the career. I worked in TV news myself early on uh, in in a tiny TV TV news station that no longer exists in oh, the yeah. town of <laughs> yeah of course right in Vancouver in Vancouver Washington and wow. and I recently had a listener and this is why it's interesting for me and I think some of my listeners to, to talk with you about this is I also recently um, mentioned I think in the, I think it was the uh, the episode before this one uh, I had gotten an email from. From a listener, and he's getting ready to start working on his first documentary film project. And he was concerned that he didn't have any doc experience. And when I learned a little bit more about him and his background, I immediately told him that that how untrue that was that he did in fact have doc experience because he was currently working at a TV news station. Mm -hmm. And I said, "Listen, man, you're crafting stories every day. It would help." you know, this particular listener and I think others to understand that, hey, working in TV news, having that experience, whether it's as a shooter, whether it's as an editor, of course, sometimes they both do both. They often can do both, um, whether it's, as, as, it's, it's an anchor or a producer. How do we, would you say working in TV news shaped your own documentary, your interest and expertise? Oh, my gosh. It is the best training ever <laughs> for so many reasons. And I wish, you know, there's so many people that come to my website that are, you know, always asking me, how do I get started? You know, what do I do? How do I yeah. do an interview? You know, um, <laughs> and and a big part of it is just breaking the ice. 
you know, um, I, and I think that's what TV news does is it throws you out there every single day. Oh, yeah. You are forced, forced to meet people you have never heard of, don't know anything about you. You know, all you have is your wits and your creativity and you are just sent out into the world. Thrown to the wolves. <laughs> yeah, thrown to the wolves. And, and you've got to um, make people comfortable. You've got to build trust within a very short amount of time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and you've got to make people feel comfortable in this very odd situation with the camera there. And um, and you've got to to have them perform at their best. You, you're, you're looking for their truth. Um, their, you know, what's, what's their perspective. And every day you're, you're thrown with a new person and a new situation. And it is just the best training ground ever. Now I will say this, mm. I did TV news for seven years and then, uh, video production, but, but there was a transition, a pretty, um, steep transition to go from TV news to filmmaking. Right. It is different. It is different. And, and I did uh, sign up for a workshop in Maine, uh, which was phenomenal. It was a couple of weeks that just taught me the basics of kind of filmmaking. Because in news, you don't have music. It's facts. <laughs> And in filmmaking, you're you're creating a story, you're creating an emotional experience, and that is very different from news. With that said, a news background is a phenomenal training ground. I think that you really something that spoke to me um, was when you mentioned the idea of building very quickly, having to build trust with the situation and the camera there with the person that you're speaking with, and you know. That, that is such a critical component to what we do as doc filmmakers. If we don't have the trust of the person that we're filming, it, it, it just completely changes the complexion of the interview. Even if you end up having an interview, if they don't trust you, it's, mm -hmm. it is a vital relationship. And it doesn't, you know, here's an interesting, interesting thing is that it doesn't necessarily happen right out of the gate. I mean, you hope you can make that happen out of the gate when you're doing like a TV news story, I guess. But yeah. with it's it's interesting the relationship that develops through the course of time when you say or with a subject that you're making a film about or you're spending an, a lot of time with a particular person mm -hmm. or subject and the building of trust happens through that course of time. Well, and, and that's actually something that really appealed to me and why I, I transitioned into documentaries away from news is that doing news for all those years, you just always know that you're just barely touching the surface. Oh, yeah. You know, and, it's, and, and it becomes really uh, not satisfying, yep. you know, yep. because you're just, it's so surfacey, so shallow. You're just... Completely. You know, two minutes, how much can you say in a minute or two? I mean, actually a lot, but uh, <laughs> I, I just always knew there was so much more to the story. And um, you know about what, what was funny is mm. that when I did my documentary, Briars, I could have made a 13 part series, you know, oh, a 13 hours. And then you realize, you know, you can still only fit so much in an hour. Yes, it's right. still, you can go into much more detail, but you're you're always having to cut something out. But that's actually, I'm kind of transitioning a lot, but this is the wonderful thing about the web mm. is that now you can have the documentary, but then you can have all these great outtakes that you can still show that don't end up in the film, but are still wonderful little nuggets in and of themselves, but for whatever reason, just don't carry the story oh, forward man. and can't make it into oh, the man. documentary. I, yeah, I, you, you absolutely. I do. And, 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 and as, as you know, a film geek for years, I, I often, I often sometimes, not that I liked it more than the film, but I dug the behind the scenes footage. I dug seeing what got cut out of the film because I like to sort of put together and piece together why and how, you know, maybe the editor or director made those decisions. With with my film that I shot in Nepal, Journey to Kathmandu, I often say when somebody, you know, either downloads the film or buys the DVD, I always sort of, you know, try to try to urge them, make sure to watch the extras because the yeah. extras are, are kind of like the fun part, especially yeah. for budding filmmakers. You get a real behind the scenes look. Mm -hmm. um, I want to jump back to something you said about you know, a, another major difference when you're doing documentary films versus the TV news stuff. And it's a big thing that for me was that I too really appreciate the relationship and the connection that you're making with 
um, an individual or other individuals. It's it's a big part of the reason I do docs to begin with is not only for the final final film, but I love the process of, of oh, the yeah. filmmaking. I love the, the human connections that you make. Mm-hmm. And honestly, it, it's one of the easily the top three reasons I do I do this type of work. And I'm guessing that that's the case for you is the connections that you make with human beings. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think to be a filmmaker, you just have to have an insatiable curiosity. Hmm insatiable curiosity and I am honestly genuinely fascinated by every human being I meet (laughs) because I know they everybody has a story and they just need time to kind of tell you that story and so I'm just fascinated by people's stories I'm fascinated by stories and I love storytelling but um that's a big reason I do it I just I just love digging, you know, and exploring. Oh, and I man. think we're all explorers. I we're think all explorers. We're, do- you know, documentary filmmakers are explorers and we're exploring our own inner selves. You know, I think the documentary is a, an exploration of, for ourselves. Mm. You know, we're learning something new. And if we're not, then we shouldn't be doing it. I think a film really is, it should be a question, you know, like you don't know all the answers and that's why you're doing it because you're you're fascinated by it you're curious by it you're you're wondering why is it this way and by interviewing all these people and gathering the information it starts to come together for you and it and it's a it's a it, it is a journey and it's a it's a magical journey and uh i know with briars i did not want that documentary to end <laughs> isn't that funny because it was it was the journey that was important, you know, not the end. And uh, and you know, I do know some people that their documentaries take 10, 20 years. Yeah. Oh, sure, know? absolutely. And and, uh, and some subject matters uh, require that, right. but uh, I, I believe that some people just don't want it to end because the journey is what's so special. Let's continue on with your journey. Now on to the international journalism aspect of your life. How did the working as an international correspondent come to be? Well, it came out of that desire of, oh, well, this is a complicated answer. Okay, Gosh, good. About five, things, Great. About five things popped up when you said that. <laughs> Excellent. That's what I was well, hoping for. I had been a local news reporter for seven years hmm. and you know, as you saw from my background, I grew up partly in Africa. Yes. My uh, parents started Habitat for Humanity International. And so I feel like I'm a world citizen. Mm. And I've always been around people of different cultures. We, you know, lived in uh, Paris, you know, before we went to Africa and then lived in Africa. And um, I've traveled to 40 countries. Um, so I've just, I've got this international part of me. Uh, that uh, is just ingrained in who I am. And so I really started yearning to to see the world. And I had been in South Carolina for seven years. And so I pitched the idea to my news director of, hey, you know, I'm, I want to travel the world. And is there any way that I could report for you guys, you know, on the road? And to my amazement, uh, the answer was yes. And oh, so that's man. kind of uh, my entry into being a one man, one woman, one person crew yep. um, traveling the world. And I reported back uh, to my station. I, you know, I found kind of local connections okay. like um, Hungary and uh, Macedonia and um, Yugoslavia and, um, uh, and Egypt and Israel. And I would find kind of people in South Carolina that were in these places and I would go and, um, Oh, that was your pinpoint. So you were finding people who were from South Carolina that was doing work in these countries. And that, those are the stories that you were, you were, um, you were doing. Yes. Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's, I, and, uh, yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. I, I wondered if, well, who, was your producer assigning you stories? Were you finding them? Were they lifestyle stories? But there you go. Okay, there's the connection, South Carolina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and then, well, and I also covered the Gulf War for my TV station um, in, I guess that was 1991. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was an assignment. Um, 
So it just, and it's a variety of things. And then I ended up working for Habitat for Humanity and I traveled as a one person crew a lot of the time uh, around the world uh, covering stories for Habitat doing right. kind of these nonprofit uh, productions. So does that help answer it? Ab- no, it absolutely does. Travel and doing film work overseas is a massive part of what my wife, Steph, and I do. So far, the vast majority of, of our work, and especially my work, the doc work, has been in Southeast Asia. Um, in fact, Steph and I met in Malaysia, a place where I know that you have spent some time. She was working in, in feature films there. She's from the UK, so she was kind of working in both London and then in KL, uh, working as an, as an AD. And I happened to be on a corporate video shoot there for Intel in Malaysia, and that's where we met. And a few years later, look where we are now. And we now have two kids. We have a, a two-and-a-half-year-old and, and a five-month-old. And, and, you know, we having connected and met in a travel and a worldly and mm-hmm. filmmaking experiences and passions, it's something that not unlike what, what you were brought up with, we want to, you know, it's, it's our plan faith to really instill that in our own kids. We want mm-hmm. them to have a worldly view. We want to live in many places. You know, when we were filming in, uh, when we were filming Elvis of Cambodia at the time, Flynn was ten months old, and people thought we were out of our minds for wow. going to live there five months wow. with a ten month old. And and it couldn't have been a more amazing experience in many ways. And not that he'll remember that, but there's something about early on sort of instilling this and knowing yeah. that this is how we want our to live our lives and how we want to how we want our kids to be brought up is a really mm-hmm. important thing. Um, Having been brought up, understanding the importance of an open mind, being open to cultures, um, living abroad, how has that shaped your, the way in which you tell and, and the, let's see, how has that shaped the people's stories you tell and the way in which you tell them? (laughs) Good job. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's what editing's for, right? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) No, I, I, I'm laughing because I just I'm I I just love it because um, anyway my answer my answer is um, I always told my parents the biggest gift the best gift they ever gave me yeah. was the opportunity of living in another culture. <laughs> it's it's profound what it does to a child, and I just know that it has shaped who I am, how I see the world. And it doesn't make me afraid of people who are different than me. Yeah, right. Someone who (laughs) looks completely different than me, who sounds completely different from me, can be a, you know, a phenomenal human being. Mm. And it's, it's learning to respect people from wherever they are, wherever they've come from, and to value them and to just not be afraid of them. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, you just learn how many phenomenal people there are around the world. And, and it's important to step out of your own tribe uh, to, see, to see what's being offered by other people from, from completely different per- perspectives, perspective than yours. And, so it makes yeah. me a better person for sure. Absolutely. And, and, and how do you feel that's reflected in the type of work that you do now as, as say a doc filmmaker? Oh, I mean, it just makes me fascinated by life. Hmm. You know, it just makes me fascinated by different people and different stories. And that's kind of back full circle to what I was talking about at the beginning. I'm just, I just know that there's incredible stories out there that never end. So you've got a great idea for a documentary film. Awesome. I'd love to hear about it, but I don't have a ton of time. Can you tell me about it in 30 seconds or less? Oh, you don't quite have your pitch down yet. Okay, that's fine. What's your website where I can find more information? Maybe a press kit I can take a look at. You don't have one. Well, have you thought about how you might raise some funds to help with the costs of making films? They can be expensive, right? You haven't. Okay, maybe just tell me about your audience. Who's going to want to see your film? Who will you be marketing it to? You don't know this either. Okay, then I'm going to assume you haven't thought about how you'll be getting your film out into the world then, right? I think I see what's going on here. 
I was once in your shoes. A great idea for a doc. Camera in one hand, a boom mic in the other. But other than that, not much other than a whole lot of excitement and gumption. And that's great. You'll need all of that. But you'll also need a heck of a lot more if you're looking to make the kind of documentary film that you can be proud of. The kind that people will want to see and will impact them. The kind that won't break the bank while you're making it. And dare I say, you might even make some money from. You need support, and we've got you covered. We built the Documentary Academy with you in mind. We've got all the resources you need to make a successful documentary film you can be proud of. Come and enroll at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy, and let's turn that doc idea into a reality. You worked as a senior video producer with Habitat for Humanity. About 10 years ago, that would have been like my dream job. I, wa you know, I, I wanted to do something similar with an organization here, an international humanitarian organization called Mercy Corps based out yes. of Portland, Oregon. And, and it's, it's next to near impossible unless you have really, really good connections. I have found with people to even really kind of get in the door and do video work with these, the bigger NGOs and humanitarian mm -hmm. organizations. And so what I'd love to, to maybe hear from you is some advice for, my, you know, my listeners who, as you know, a lot of documentary filmmakers get their starts doing work with nonprofits and NGOs. Mm -hmm. It's an important thing for them. It's often very low paying, but it's, you know, what you get in return is great access to parts of the world, cultures, and stories that most people would not normally get. Mm -hmm. I guess the first thing I'd ask you is, would you recommend this as a path for maybe a younger, maybe more up and coming doc filmmaker? And if so... What do you think the marketplace for that kind of work is like? Mm, absolutely, yes. Just like news, this is another great entry point into documentary filmmaking. Possibly even better, mm. just because you do have the, the filmmaking angle to it. Um, yes, so I think working for nonprofits and the job I had with Habitat for Humanity is the dream job mm for a documentary filmmaker because I think documentary filmmakers are change makers are we we see the world in a in an idealistic way or we, <laughs> we we want the world to be better and we love being part of something positive you know we and I think most of us with our documentaries we're trying to change the world in some way oh yeah absolutely we end up being changed in the process yeah. but I think we are ultimately looking to make the world a better place. And that's what I was trying to do with my documentary, Brides in the Cotton Patch. Mm. There was healing that had to be done in our community. And, and I needed to be healed because there was some, some deep stuff that had happened. Uh, and, and my film was meant to be a healing process. And so I think that documentary filmmakers this is probably a generalization. You know, we're not all the same. Uh, we're all very different, but in general, I think we we're trying to to do something positive and make our life mean something and to have a small part in in making the world a better place. And so so a nonprofit um, atmosphere is, is is the perfect place for us to kind of um, to play that part. And nonprofits, you know, most a lot of them don't have the money to hire mm. a film crew. And so they will happily you know, if you offer to make a film for them for free, mm. uh, most of them, you know, I mean, you have to build that trust, that relationship and know that they have to feel like you're not going to waste their time. Um, so you have to be serious about it. Mm. Um, but I started as a volunteer with Habitat. Right, right. And, and actually, it's funny because it was my transition away from TV news and there was a moment where I had to decide, I traveled the world and did, you know, those stories for my local TV station. And there was a moment when I had been offered a, a main anchor TV job in Virginia at a TV <laughs> station. It was kind of the next career move. Totally. Uh, you know, going from uh, a weekend anchor and a, a, a news reporter, general, general news reporter in South Carolina. This was a main anchor job and yeah. I got offered the job. And, but at the same time, I got offered a volunteer position with <laughs> Habitat for Humanity, but traveling to Africa as a one person crew. It, I pretended to think about it for a weekend. <laughs> wow. Um, but I turned down the anchor job and uh, became a volunteer and traveled uh, to Africa 
uh, for, I think the first year was a volunteer, but you know, they paid for my, my travel and, um, you know, they paid all the expenses, but it wasn't a paid position. And then once they realized the value mm. of having their story told, you know, I was going to all the little villages in Africa, in Ghana, Zambia, Botswana, South Africa. Oh, um, you know, I wasn't going to the tourist spots. I was going right. to the little villages and telling those stories. And, uh, and so then they, they didn't really have a video department. They had one guy who was doing video uh, but nobody really traveling and really doing kind of these mini documentaries. And, and it showed them the value. And, and kind of after I started, the video department uh, grew after that. And um, so it definitely is a dream job. And if you are trying to get into filmmaking and want some practice, I think uh, approaching, you know, the smaller nonprofits are going to be much happier to hear from you. You know, the bigger nonprofits, they, you know, you're, they, they, uh, they're, they're less open um, oh, yeah. to just somebody volunteering. But if you can approach a smaller one, and you just have to know your own skill level and what you offer, um, and start building that relationship. And um, you know, it's just, it's a great way to, to, to definitely get some experience. And, and one thing that I would add to, to our listeners, at least from my experience, and, and just towards the end of what you were talking about there, you mentioned it, it is, it's probably more advantageous to go to the smaller ones initially. The bigger ones, as you said, aren't as open. And, and a big part of that is, at least when I found the, the multiple times that I tried to bang down Mercy Corps' door, they already had world-renowned photographers yes. and videographers doing work pro bono for them. And so, yeah. you know, who's this, you know, yeah. you know, 30 yeah. something who's banging on our door who doesn't have a ton of experience, but he's really eager. But I mean, we'd love to help this guy. But we look, we already have, you know, this, mm-hmm. these, these incredibly experienced, mm-hmm. um, amazing storytellers already on board doing work for free. So yeah. um, mm-hmm. I'm glad that you mentioned that at the end. Uh, one thing I do want to go back to here real quick is. Faith, I have to, I got to hear, there's, there's got to be a story here. There's got to be a real soulful moment. You making that decision to go from, you know, a career trajectory that you had working five, six, seven years as a general news reporter, then a weekend anchor and an anchor position comes up in a, in a, in a decent market. And you decide to turn that down to volunteer, to go tell stories in Africa. What how did you come to that decision? And you and you said that it was it was a very quick and easy decision for you. So many people that you and I both know would have would have would think that you're crazy, you're nuts to turn that down, right? What was it for you that was a no brainer for you that I, no, I I, can't, I know I was on this career path, but I'm gonna go over here and do this other work. Mm-hmm. Well, it it. it uh... I mean, I said I pretended to think about it. I mean, I really did think about it. You know, it was a, a moment, it was a big decision. Um, you know, but I think intellectually, I I I, I felt like I was make, trying to make a decision. But in my heart, <laughs> in, in my heart, I'm an adventurer. Yeah. You know, and and I, I'm an international. I, I resonate with being an international citizen. You know, and and being out into the world in the world and. Being um, in local news, you're really just in that one place. And I just really was, at that time in my life, was yearning for something on an international platform. And I am a private person. Mm. I mean, I know I, I, I'm an extrovert. Mm. Um, you know, maybe you can hear it in my voice. I get excited. <laughs> Likewise. My husband is a true introvert, and he's like, oh, that's, uh, too, "Of course, that's how excited. it works." <laughs> so I'm like, I, I can't help it; it's just who I am. So I am an extrovert, yeah. But I, I you know, being a, in the news, you you're just, you know, you're just in the public eye, and there was just a part of me that was ready to not be in the public eye uh, anymore. All right, okay. and that's why you don't know my story on desktop documentaries because. I'm, you know, I just, I, I haven't wanted it to be about me. I've wanted it to be about, you know, the filmmakers who come to the site. And so I don't really take a lot of time to, uh, you know, tell my story, which yeah. I probably should, you know, in this age of internet, you know, nobody, you know, you, you really do need to explain to people where you come from and, and who you are so that, you know, you I mean, there's just so many, you just don't know who you're dealing with. So yeah, I would just kind of just, wanted to, to 
to be in the background. And, and you know, some people go into TV news because they enjoy being in the limelight. Right. And I ne that was never my motivation. I love, love, love the storytelling process. I love the behind the scenes stuff. Editing is my favorite part of the process. Just yeah. this, you know, just when it all comes together. So I just love the behind the scenes stuff. Um, and so that's why documentaries really appealed to me because I'm more, I'm, I'm the listener. I'm the, the person, you know, asking the questions and pulling in the information and putting the whole story together. And it was never the, the part of being on camera, never, it was just, I, you know, like you just have to do it, you know, it's just part of the job. Mm. So I did it, but, um, so that was another element to it. So it's, you know, when people make decisions in their lives, it's never simple, you know, it's usually kind of a complex web of, of reasons that all kind of come together at, at a particular time. So, and it's, I think I find, I think, I think you, you nailed it. I think that's very true, but I would also add something that you, that, that spoke to me that you said earlier about you, you intellectually, you thought about, um, you thought about whether you should take the job or whether you yeah. should take the volunteer job, but emotionally you'd already made that decision. Yeah, I right. think a lot of us, especially myself included, I'm sure Steph would tell you that it's easy for me to intellectualize things. Yes, and I can and I can do that till the you know till the cows come home, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And but it's really about what does your heart speak and where does the emotion lie. And I feel like I'm I'm learning that more than ever. You know, at my ripe young age of uh, 40, 45, on the cusp of forty, yeah, on the cusp of forty five <laughs> years old, I'm I'm still having to learn these valuable life experiences that I feel like most other human beings probably learned 15, 20 years ago. I think that we as humans can overcomplicate things and we can over intellectualize yeah. things when really just all we sometimes need to do is look at how we feel in a situation, mm -hmm. look at how we feel in a, in another person's presence, or how we yeah. feel about our job. And um, yeah, so that really spoke to me. I'm, I'm glad that you said that. So at this point, you've left behind your TV news. You, I'm not sure if you left behind your position as the as a senior video producer with Habitat at this point or not, or if you were doing it in conjunction. But Briars, the film Briars and the Cotton Patch, came to be, and I would love to know how you decided to first do. Briars and the Cotton Patch. Mm -hmm. This is a great question, and I'm really glad you asked it because mm. a lot of people who come to desktop documentaries are asking me, "How do I even get started on my documentary? What you know? What do I do first? Yeah. And you know how I made my documentary? It didn't even start as a documentary idea. It just started as a fascination, a curiosity, and I made a short little three-minute production. There was a little event, like a, a grand opening of kind of the Clarence Jordan Center. Okay. And Clarence Jordan, if you see my documentary, you know he's kind of the, the, main, the main character of the documentary. And it was really just to, uh, the event was to honor him, to recognize him, and to kind of... Uh, you know, bless this new building in his honor. And so I was thinking, oh, that'd be kind of neat, you know, to do a, a you know, just a little like piece three minute yeah. Uh, piece. Yeah, that will show at the event and, and we'll give people some history about who Clarence Jordan is. Well, <laughs> this little three minute thing, I started interviewing people and I, I just went, oh my, oh my gosh. Whoa, whoa, there's so known, much bigger stories to so, tell here, oh, right? This, oh, this is so much bigger. I get it. <laughs> and it was all I could do to just, do a little three minute piece on it. And I just knew I, I had to keep doing the interview. It was just, it was a phenomenal story and so many twists and turns and drama. And uh, it, it was just fascinating to me. And I didn't know the story, even though I had grown up with it, oh, even though I had wow. heard it, uh, I didn't know the story. And I realized when I started doing the interviews that I really had, had no idea what had happened. So I just started digging and digging and digging and digging and interviewing and interviewing and interviewing and interviewing. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yes, and I was working full time for Habitat at that time. Okay, and like, okay. And like most people, most documentary filmmakers, you have to be making a living some other way. And <laughs> we talk about that a lot on this show. <laughs> yeah, so, you, so, so I was doing my documentary at nights and on the weekends and I would just, on my time off, I would go and do these interviews. Yeah. Um, and so it took me three years to make it. Mm -hmm. If I was full time on it, I could I could have done it in six months. Yeah. But um, but because I was doing, I mean, I was so burned out by the end of that thing. Woo! Because you just uh, you know 
you just are working on it every spare minute, um, you know, in your off time. But it was a pure joy. It was just a, an incredible journey and uh, were very much worth it. Well, even three years is actually a pretty quick turnaround, I'm finding, to do a feature doc like that. Mm -hmm. So congratulations on yeah, that. Yeah, it just depends. Yeah, it depends on the subject matter. And and I am kind of, uh, I am a, an extra, I'm a workaholic, I have to be honest. Okay. And once I set my mind to something, I am like a bulldog and will not let loose until that thing is done. And so I can completely uh, hear that in your voice. It's awesome. <laughs> So I can, so I may or may not be typical. I don't know. And you have, but honestly, to do make a documentary, you have to have extraordinary persistence because persistence, it is resilience, so yeah. easy to give up at so many points in the process. It, it, you just have to have just grit. You just have to push through. And you we talk have, about that a lot on this show because yeah. because the fact of the matter is. The, the odds are actually against you. Most yes. people that set out to make a film do not end up fi finishing it. A high okay. percentage of people do not end yeah. up seeing it yeah. all the way through. Yeah. Um, before we get too far into this, could you would you mind briefly giving a description of what Briars and the Cotton Patch is about so my listeners have some context? Yes. Um, Briars and the Cotton Patch is about this experiment that happened in the 1940s and 50s in Southwest Georgia. And the experiment was blacks and whites living together in this community as equals. And if you know anything about the civil rights mm. and about the relationship between blacks and whites during that time period, I mean, it was, it, it, you can imagine the violence that it, spurred and the angst that it caused the local community for there to be blacks and whites living and working as equals in this little community. So my documentary is about what happens during this experiment. I can't say enough that it even, maybe especially during this time with sort of current news that's happening in, in the United States, it's an appropriate time to be sort of revisiting this material. Mm -hmm. And I say revisiting loosely because we are still living all of it in many ways. And yeah. and 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 the story of what happens in Atticus and Koinonia is is not something that's often talked about or I certainly didn't know about it. Um, when you hear about civil rights, you know, places like Alabama are the places that jump yes. out, not what was happening in Southwest Georgia mm -hmm. and, and what Clarence was doing on, and, and of course so many other people on this farm. Um, mm -hmm. It's an amazing story. And uh, I'm really happy and honored that huh. I was, I, I got to, got to know it because um, now I feel like I know a bit more about our, our history and uh, yeah. it's a real important thing to know about. How cool. can, um, yes. how can people see this film? Amazon is the easiest way. Which is where Steph and mm -hmm. I watched it. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned early in the conversation doing this film. It was a healing process probably for a lot of people. Or you were filming people that have been going through a healing process for years and years and years. How was it a healing process for you on a personal level when you were doing this film? Well, you know, like we, we had lived in Africa uh, during kind of my younger years. And then when we moved to America's Georgia where I went to high school, when we moved away from Koinonia, it's pronounced Koinonia, actually. It's a funky, Koinonia. weird name. It's a Greek word that means uh, community. Uh, but right. when, we, when we moved, we lived at Koinonia for, for a number of years, but then we moved into the little town, Americas. And literally the first week we moved into town, people threw uh, glass bottles mm. in our driveway, you know, just to, I mean, we, we knew we weren't welcome. And uh, you know, the, the local, the blacks, you know, welcomed us, but the, I'm referring to the whites, the local white community, right. um, did not appreciate what Quinonia represented and our family represented. And so I was kind of an outcast, you know, um, our family was not welcomed into the, the, uh, the established white community. Mm. Um, so, but I, I did not have the reaction that the, 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 the young, well, I, I call them kids, they're in their, you know, 60s now, but right. um, at the time, kid, the Quinonia kids, they had horrible 
um, violent experiences at, at school. I yeah. had nothing like that. Mm-hmm. I actually had a very positive uh, experience in high school, but I knew that, that that feeling was under the surface. Wow. And I never quite knew why. And that was the thing. I, I kind of knew we were outcasts. I mean, people were friendly to me. And, but I knew that there was like this subtle, you know, un, unsaid thing. And, you know, and I was like, well, we're good people. Why, why, are, <laughs> why, are, uh, why, are, why do people see us like this? And I never quite, I never really, really, really knew. And, and so that's why it was a healing process for me to really understand. We upset people. Not we, I didn't do anything. Yeah, right. <laughs> but uh, Quinonia and my father, yeah. you know, uh, uh, was was very heavily into it. My father had an incredible amount of courage because at that time it was just uh, hateful. I mean, it was just, people, you know, you were messing around with the way things have been for a long time. Oh, yeah. And uh, you're messing around with... Uh, you know, the labor market um, was cheap. Mm, mm. And if you suddenly start making uh, the labor market uh, equal pay, you know, to that's what a, that's a big whites problem. were making, yeah. suddenly, you know, these people who had these big properties, you know, they're losing their cheap labor. And you're messing with some lifestyle. You know, you're messing with their lifestyle. And, uh, and you're messing with their pocketbook. And that's, yeah. you know, you don't, you don't do that. And there's just a certain hierarchy of, of the way things worked. And uh, we were messing with that core fundamental cu- culture, the way the culture worked. And uh, it did not go over well. Yeah. The, the film is Briars in the Cotton Patch. It's an important film to watch. I think it's important even maybe more so now in light of what's been happening in our country in recent yeah. relations. Um, you, can, you can view it on Amazon.com, so I highly recommend it. Um, moving on to now, <laughs> why I first initially contacted you, which was the website Desktop Documentaries. Mm-hmm. When did the idea for the website come to be? And 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 in this, you can also tell you know listeners who haven't been there yet what the site's all about. The site was born out of my love of documentary filmmaking, uh, but on a more practical level, it was actually a class assignment. I was taking a, an online cor- a course on uh, uh, online marketing, hmm. and the assignment was to start a blog about something that you're passionate about. Oh, and that's, wow, okay. And so I had no expectation, you know. Um, I just started writing articles and, and started just writing what I knew about filmmaking. And it, I, I mean, it just grew into this thing I never, ever would have imagined it. It has just blossomed into this thing that that I I, I could have never planned for. I'll bet. And um, the site now gets nearly a million visitors a year. Wow! Amazing. <laughs> that so, is in, that's mind boggling, isn't it? It just grew and grew and grew, <laughs> and uh, and my you know workaholic tendency. Yeah. I, it just as I saw that it was actually helping people, people mm. started like you with your podcast, people are starting to send you questions. And ultimately deep down I I I love to help people make their dreams come true. Yeah. You right. know, I don't like people to struggle. You know, I want if there's something they really desire, I want to be able to help them to do that. And I just, you know, these wonderful, passionate people who had, you know, these great documentary ideas or something they wanted to say in the world started finding me and asking for advice. And, you know, I just, it just started to grow. And I just start I like, oh, you, you're interested in that? Oh, I, you know, I, I can help you with that. Well, you know, well, that's easy. You know, you just do that, you know, or whatever, whatever it was. And, uh, and, you know, my desire to make this a, a, an incredible resource for people um, just grew and grew and grew and grew. And it's now been eight years, something like that started at, uh, at the end of 2008 and um, just kind of took over my life. <laughs> Well, and it's and you can see that the passion comes through. I think I think I I mentioned that I've been you know following it over the past year, but I was I was certainly aware of it before that. I just wasn't following it as much as I was this sort of this past year. And it, what does come through is that it's it's practical advice. It's I think it's targeted a bit, and correct me if I'm wrong here. It seems to be targeted for um, first time filmmakers as a resource for them. 
Yes. And and what I have noticed very recently is it's been significantly updated and upgraded. The site's a, a yeah. beautiful site now, and it's very easily navigable. When did that happen, and why did you choose to do that? Well, it has been always growing, mm. and but there are times when I've had to take a break from it uh, to work on various projects uh, here and there. Yeah. And um, last year, I ended up... Uh, having to take quite a bit of time off because of uh, some just other projects that came up that needed to be dealt with. And so this year I just said, all right, I am getting this website back on track and uh, really, really give it the attention it deserves. Wow. And so I have just poured myself into it this year and to really make it a top-notch resource. So I'm so happy you noticed um, you know, oh, I always yeah. wonder what, what are people noticing? You know, are people, do people even care, you know, that I'm doing this? Uh, so I'm very happy to hear that, that the hard work has been recognized. And, uh, so yeah, it's just really, um, giving, just saying, I'm, you know, I'm just really committing to, to making this a top notch resource. And, and, and I have just launched a new documentary filmmaking learning center. Right. And, right. Um, I'm actually officially announcing that next week. I don't know when this podcast will air. It, but... it will air next Friday. Excellent. Okay. Yep. So the Learning Center will be fully live at that point. And this is kind of, you know, the, the courses and the templates and stuff like that. Yep. And what I'm doing now is opening it up to other filmmakers to provide courses and to become mentors. Because as you know, one person can does not have the full picture of documentary filmmaking and i just want to be able to be a hub for for documentary filmmakers to teach other documentary filmmakers oh man that's fantastic how to do this so i'm one mentor but you could be a mentor i've got wow. phenomenal filmmakers that have contributed to my site right uh, Oscar nominated Daniel Ray. He just he just did a beautiful article about his his uh, script writing process for his latest documentary, Harold and Lillian. It was just so helpful, and would love and and I'm working toward getting more people, more accomplished filmmakers, uh, to to come on board and become mentors. Wow, that's fantastic! Um, I, I would yeah. love to talk with you about that maybe offline. I think that's that's fantastic. I love it. Yes. I'd love to help out in, in any way I can. You officially invited, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. I, I'm honored. I, I mean, it, this is perfect. It, it segues into sort of my next thought, which is quite a bit about what, quite a bit of what you are doing with the site is what I set out to do with this podcast. You offer a resource for people to come to that might be looking for answers on you know, any number of documentary related questions, you know, here on the documentary life, I'm trying to facilitate, you know, the networking of documentary filmmakers to share their stories, mm -hmm. um, their wealth of information that, and, and in hopes that we can all benefit from that. Yes. You know, yes. the podcast is only 10 episodes young, but, but both on a personal and professional level, I'm already seeing, I feel like I'm, I'm seeing and feeling great benefit, benefit from the podcast. I'm, I'm meeting people from all over the world, you know, both virtually and physically as a filmmaker. I, myself, I feel like I'm gaining access to some resources that I didn't necessarily have prior to the show. Mm -hmm. And and like yourself, I'm receiving emails from listeners who are thanking me for doing a show like this and and often offering up their own constructive criticism, criticisms and, you know, maybe have a question or two that they'd like to share with listeners. Mm -hmm. um, how is the how is the website benefiting you both on a personal and professional level? And then how how do you feel through having done it, you know, seven to 10 years? How is it benefiting others? Oh, well, you're exactly right. You, you have gotten bitten by the bug that I got bitten Oh, with. man. <laughs> because, because, you know, you get feedback from people and it yeah. just fuels the fire. It does. It does. You're right. Oh, I get some of the most incredible stories. Just, you know, people sharing just, you know, what they're going through, their struggles. Uh, and you realize that the, you know, the struggles you've had, mm. you know, like you realize that it's universal. Yeah, we're you know, not alone. You're not alone, and, and making a documentary is, you know, it, it can be isolating. Very you know, isolating, you, right. 
You're like, you, you know, you, you are your own hero. You know, you are just out there battling the world on your own. Yeah. And nobody knows what you're going through. And, and, uh, and, it, and, and you're just out there feeling alone. And a lot of documentary filmmakers are not in Hollywood or not in New York. Right. You know, they're in small towns in Georgia or in Iowa. Or, Thankfully you know, for that. Yeah, or, or in a little village in Africa. Yeah. I get so many people from Africa, um, passionate <laughs> storytellers who have great stories. And, you know, you just, um, you know, you, you, you start seeing that everybody has these universal struggles with funding. You know, how in the world oh, do I man. get funding? You know, that's like the most um, asked question, isn't it? <laughs> you know, fundraising, um, gear, and distribution those are major pain points in the filmmaking process and storytelling you know uh oh, people sure. really struggle with with you know and there is a process you know there are some core fundamental things you need to know about uh storytelling and i've learned a lot you know because people will ask me a question i'll go well i'm not actually sure about that let me let me research let so, me go over so here think, and look that up totally yeah, let me research and, and, uh, this my, my journalism comes in handy and I'll just find the people who know about that specialty and uh, I'll figure it out and then I'll share what I learn. And so I never, ever claim, you know, to, to know everything, you know, I'm just a filmmaker out there figuring it out like everybody else. But, you know, I'm just um, in a support role, you know, that if I don't know something that I, I will do my best to go out and get the best answer I can. So I have learned so much it's just oh, kind of man. like if you want to learn something teach it yeah right and, and that is the best way to learn because um you have to fully understand it yourself to be able to teach it so that's and, kind of what this website has become and i have felt that in very similar fashion already with this podcast you know initially or early on you know, I had moments where I felt like, wow, who am I to be talking about documentaries? Yes. Like, who am I to be talking about how to live, you know, live yes. a, this idea of a documentary life? Yes. And, and I'm not the expert on these, but that's kind of the point for, right. for a website like Desktop Documentaries or for a podcast like The Documentary Life. It's, it's this sharing of ideas, this mm -hmm. networking of a community that often is left sort of in isolated isolated fashion as you were as you were saying earlier and i think what you and i do is we're trying to bring people together so we don't feel so alone and yes. try to um yeah let's let's hear one another's tales let's learn how to be storytellers well, let's learn what kind of camera to use let's learn about how to approach people with interviews let's learn mm -hmm. what it means to have a day job and then be pursuing your passion Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, before exactly. before before I move on towards the towards the the end of the of the program, something I, I I want to um I want to give you a moment to talk about is the online courses that you have on desktop documentaries. You have the the seven day how to make a documentary film course. You have the very practical you know downloadable releases and legal forms. You have a fund mm -hmm. fundraising course, and maybe mm -hmm. this is you're going to be putting all of this together in your release next week, but. Give us some idea, give my listeners an idea of the online courses that you offer, how they go to it, and um, yeah, just, just let mm -hmm. us know how they can attend your classes, if you will. Yeah, well, again, these were simply born out of just me getting the same questions over and over and over again, and just starting to develop a curriculum based on what people wanted to know, and it just kind of happened organically. They would ask me for, uh, you know, a proposal template or how do I, how do I, how do I make a proposal? And me, so, uh, you know, I ended up creating this uh, guide, you know, of how to write a proposal and here's a proposal template. Here is how you, how you put one together. And so kind of, a, uh, you know, that became something that I offered people uh, if they if they wanted that and then budget templates, you know, they needed, you know, to know what a budget template was and then legal forms. I have uh, Gordon Firemark, who's an entertainment attorney. Right, and, saw uh, that. Yeah. And he put together uh, these legal forms, um, uh, especially for documentary filmmakers. Mm -hmm. And that's just something people request and need. It's yeah, a practical, it's, and it's often something we thing. get bogged down in not knowing or trying to find out where that resource is. So, yeah, so continue. Yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you. It's just great no, that you have okay. that. 
Yeah, and then the crash course, it, I can't tell you how many times people have asked me, step by step, what do I do? <laughs> you know, how, I was like, oh my God, you know, it's so much, <laughs> like, okay, um, this is not something I can answer in an email or even an article, you know, it really yeah. needs attention and it's a, a huge topic, but, you know, the crash course is my attempt, uh, you know, because as you said, my core audience are first time filmmakers. They've got a great idea. Right. They might have some experience in some form or fashion, but um, it really can be a mystery. The filmmaking process can really feel like a mystery. And I've had totally. people tell me that, you know, they search for stuff online, you know, and there's kind of bits and pieces, there's stuff out there, but nobody really like explains the whole thing. You know, how does the whole thing work? Yeah. And so that's what my seven day crash course is. It, it, it really is a, you know, you know, it's it's a way that they can kind of see the full picture and go, ah, OK, right. now I get it. Now I, I kind of see behind the curtain of what actually it's 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 going to take. And a lot of people after they finish it, they go, oh, wow. OK, <laughs> it's a reality check, you know, but I, it, and it's a fine line of I don't want to discourage people. Mm -hmm. So it's it's, uh, you know, it, it's it's enough to give you the idea. But I try not to overwhelm people with too much, you know, because, you know, you can do a whole course on just how to edit on Final Cut Pro. Yeah, of course. You right. Know? Yeah. So so this is a way to give give the full picture. And then my fundraising course, you know, I feel That's, is so yeah. important. And I learned a ton putting that together. I'll bet. And uh, so that's a really key one. And that's kind of for the next level. You know, the crash course is yeah. for the person who's just got the idea. They're not quite sure what they're supposed to do. So this is a great entry point into seeing and for them to answer the question, how serious am I really about this idea? And am I willing to go on this journey? Um, and then the fundraising course is kind of the next level. It's for the person who really has decided, all right, I'm taking this seriously. And what do I actually need to do to, to get funding for this thing? So, um, so yeah, so I'm just continually trying to find ways to be supportive to the filmmaking community. 99% of desktop documentaries is free. Yes. You know, I mean, so you can come there. I mean, I've got like nearly a thousand pages on the website, just all kind of great stuff. So you can come there and just, uh, you know, learn a ton, uh, just for free, just with all the free resources. And then my courses are kind of the step, you know, when you're ready to, to dive deep, get a little, you know, you really want to take it to the next level. That's what the, the paid courses are. And so that, that helps, you know, cover the cost of, of running the site. One of the things we often either, you know, talk directly to or is, I guess, a common thread through much of the conversations and topics that I have is this idea of a documentary life, which is basically, it's a phrase that I'm using, you know, to describe how and what we do that allows us to practice our passion of documentary filmmaking. Not all of us, in fact, most of us are probably not making you know, our livings or our full livings making documentary films. You know, mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier, for instance, my wife and I run Barong Films, a video production company that produces both commercial and corporate video content. Mm -hmm. We do this while we work on the various documentary projects. This yes. pays the bills. Yes. My freelance <laughs> work as, you know, a DP director pays the bills. It allows us to continue working the craft of storytelling. One of my listeners is a wedding photographer. Another owns a food co-op. You know, yes. another works as a valet for a hotel chain downtown. Yeah, exactly. You know, we're all living in our own unique ways, documentary lives. Yes. So I would say you, Faith, are clearly very much living a documentary life. Can you give us some idea how you feel you are leading your documentary life? From the heart. Yeah. And really, this, you know, the desktop documentaries has become kind of my latest creative endeavor my latest passion project right and it has just taken this form of what desktop documentaries is which can be defined by um you know anybody who comes and visits and, and what they are able to gain from it so yeah the documentary life i think it's just living from the heart and and being authentic and being true to who you are and 
and uh, and following your 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 curiosity. That is that is my biggest message to people is to follow your curiosity. There's no one right way to do anything. Um, just you know, don't try and force yourself into something that's not natural. You know, that's not a good fit for who you are. I'm just doing like everybody else, the best I can, and we'll see where life leads us. <laughs> Leading an authentic life. I love it. I absolutely love it. You're in Mexico. Um, how did you end up, you know, there? What, and, and, and yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Well, well, living my authentic documentary life, Yeah. Uh, because my life is now online and helping other filmmakers and supporting other filmmakers, um, I'm not tied to any particular location. And right. so I have been able to fulfill this dream, this love of world travel. And uh, my husband and I, we lived in Guatemala for a year oh, and then okay. uh, at one point moved to Nicaragua and that didn't quite work out. Okay. And by just happenstance, we ended up in Mexico. It's a bit of a long story of how we ended up here, but okay. we absolutely love it. Oh, and it's wow. a shame that it gets so much negative publicity because it is a phenomenal country. And we are in this lovely, beautiful town of San Miguel de Allende. Mm. It is the most charming town. There's a huge community of expats from uh, oh. Canada, Canada, US, um, uh, Europe. Uh, and it is a, a, a very lively, artistic community. Mm. There is just all kind of art here and it's so inspiring and the people of this town are so welcoming to us the outsiders the immigrants yeah uh, and it is just they have a festival almost every weekend there's fireworks going off constantly i can't believe <laughs> they haven't been interrupted by fireworks um and it's just uh, a lovely lovely place to live we're surrounded by mountains it's the the temperature is just gorgeous here and the people are phenomenal i've made just wonderful friends here and i'm learning guitar it's Ooh. just one of these places that just inspires you creativity inspires creativity wow that's wonderful yeah. so uh great do you, are you accepting visitors steph and i and the kids will be Absolutely. there probably in the next week or two <laughs> come on down come on down that's well, fantastic you said you were coming to mexico for uh, for a uh a true job. i'll be there on i will be there shooting a job in mid-october i'll be there so faith this has just been a phenomenal conversation i am so glad that we got to meet like this and i'm excited to see where desktop documentaries takes you I would love to have you on the show again sometime. And yeah, thank you so much. Oh, anytime. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Hey, can I ask a quick favor? If you found this podcast helpful in living your doc life or making your doc film, will you help us share it with more people by giving us a stellar review on whichever platform you use to listen to this podcast? We'd really appreciate it. And you'll be helping the doc filmmaking community find us. Thanks again for listening. And we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.